go through this uh, crossing with the ferry here. Oh, well, you gave me back that um, Malcolm X tape that you were going to play, right? Yes. So I got to find it, but I don't know where I put it. I'll have to dig it up someplace. But we're going to be uh, doing the Malcolm X uh, um, movie, which we should have done uh, the other back of you uh, probably next week. And uh, we'll also be reading uh, Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. I, I would say that um, um, I think uh, Malcolm X and Whitman are good to read in contrast to each other because Whitman has a totally different attitude towards America than Malcolm X does. And uh, you know, maybe Whitman is a little too optimistic. But on the other side of it, I hate to say he walked the walk. Of, uh, I don't like that particular phraseology, but he certainly did uh, practice what he preached. And um, I don't. I, what I've been trying to say is that um, I, I hate all these people who are totally down on this country without rec recognizing its virtues. It's easy to recognize the shortcomings of things. Almost everything and everyone has shortcomings. Uh, but uh, not to um, not to acknowledge the uh, the virtues, to my mind, and you know, and to somehow uh, think that there are other areas of the world that um, don't have these shortcomings is, I think, shortcoming in itself and naive, and sometimes can lead to really a cataclysmic results. To, have such a negative view of the world. I hesitate to do the Malcolm X movie. My students like it. At least I don't like the movie, just like I didn't like um, <laughs> to use a lot of things you think you don't like. I don't personally like the movie. Uh, I think it's a poorly made movie. I think it's much too long. I think it idealizes its subject far too much. I think it doesn't show a fair picture of the warts. It to make something heroic that is maybe marginally heroic. Um, it's um, clearly not a uh, objective view of the, of the subject matter. Plus, I, my worst thing, which I feel it does, is it makes, I think, subconsciously, the people it's supposed to be making feel good feel bad. That is, I think it makes Afro-Americans feel worse. Which I think is a, is a sin in itself. Because there's no point putting people through more pain and suffering if you could make it more, uh, uh, you know, more encouraging. Uh, and uh, that's my feeling, that in the end it's a, it, it makes people down on themselves rather than go up on themselves. And, and I don't think that's, um, that's very helpful in terms of helping people live their daily life and go forward in the world, which is sometimes difficult enough. So I don't see any reason to make people feel worse than they might otherwise have felt in the name of supposedly making them feel better. Am I making any sense? What I'm trying to say is that Whitman makes you feel better, whether you like him or not. He makes you feel better, whoever you are. And there's a kind of upbeat thing to him. Uh, this movie, to my mind, is totally downbeat. And um, in the end, throughout the whole thing, it's downbeat. Uh, a view that is negative all the way through. Which is my problem with the Michael Moore movie, too. Which is these people, they're really good at, you know, bashing away at things, but they're not very good at, uh, um, they're not very good at, at, or ridiculing things, but they're not very good at providing solutions to anything. Not that anyone else is, but they don't even try. They just go the bashing route. And uh, that was my problem with the beat generation, too. So he said, your problem, your problem. Who cares what you think? No, nobody. I just happened to be teaching the class, so uh, I thought maybe I would give you the spin that this particular uh, no spin zone wants to spin in, and my spin is that I don't like these things even though I show them to you. So you say, well, why do you show them? Well, because students like them, and it's a fair and balanced, if you like, approach to these emotions. So uh, I've had um, questions, uh, questionnaires, uh, 
surveys after these things, and I, uh, the students will all respond fairly positively to this movie, so that's fine. You say, well, if students will respond positively to this movie, how come you're negative? Because I think the final effect in your psyche is negative, even though you may be enjoying the titillation of the movie, that it is, in the end, a downward effect on your spirit and psyche. So um, I show the movie for equal time, and because it is on the subject of Islam to some extent, does relate to America, uh, and it, it is a picture of um, an Islamic situation in America, if you want to, it's not real, true Islam, it's a cult a sort of Islam, that doesn't matter, uh, but um, that's why we show it, but my final feeling about the movie is, I wish I didn't have to show it. Uh, same thing for Carlos Castaneda, I, although I think he's less harmless, because I think he's just laughable. But um, the others, uh, I honestly don't, I think are not that. Anyway, let's go back to Whitman. So get ready for Malcolm X after, in the coming week. So we're on this ferry boat, and the 12 month seagulls are floating in the air. And yet, saw the slow wheeling circle and the gradual edging toward the south, saw the reflection of the summer sky in the water. Why does he see the reflection of the summer sky in the water if it's the 12th month? Because it's a summer, it's a, it's a summer-like day. It's really, uh, it's really uh, one of those balmy days you sometimes get in the middle of the winter, when the winter breaks and it's a uh, you know, summer-like day. Now, again, I asked you before, we're in one of these long, rolling, you know, cascades of images. How many of you have stood on the rail of a ferry boat and squinted your eyes at the water <coughs> and had these kinds of sensations? I imagine lots of you have. I mean, when you stood at the rail of a boat and watch the water and the, the scallop-shaped waves, the white caps, or the seagulls or the way the light bounces off the different surf objects. You sometimes do close your eyes and you see the sun in your eyes and the water and so on. And there's not much else to do except mess around with the light in your eyes and the, and the waves. And, and that's what he's doing. Now, you might describe it differently, which is fair enough. I mean, everyone would describe you different words, but you know and you identify. At least you can, you can feel what he's talking about because it's not unfamiliar to you, I would imagine. Have my eyes dazzled by the shimmering track of beams. Now, you might have expressed that differently, but you, you've had your eyes dazzled by it in a similar way, and you might use different language. Look at the fine centripetal spokes of light around the shape of my head and the sunlit water. He's staring at his head in the water. He sees the light spreading out. Look at the haze on the hills south and then southwestward. Look on the vapor at the floor <coughs> as its blue and fleece is tinged with violet. Look toward the lower bay and notice the vessels. Here, uh, vessels. Look at that. Here is his partner again. Look, 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 look. Previously it was others, 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 others. So he is following a, a, a style, here, but it's his own style, absolutely. Saw their approach. Now it's saw, saw, saw. Saw aboard those who were near me. Saw the white sails of schoolers and sloops. Saw the ships at anchor. How do I know how to read this? Sound of America. I didn't come. My parents, or not my, my parents were born in America, but my great grandparents came from other places. My great great grandparents. But I'm here now, and I'm part of this uh, culture and this continent. And the rhythms of my speech are the rhythms of the American speech. Because I've absorbed the rhythms of the American speech by osmosis, the same as you have. So you can read this poem, whoever you, whether you came from Latin America, whether you came from Eastern Europe, whether you came from Africa or wherever. This is the rhythms of your speech. And so you can respond to Whitman because he speaks the way you speak. And it's funny, it's still the same really. But a European or some other country reading this poem, they haven't got a clue how to read it. Their speech patterns are totally different. You don't realize if you hook up a guy like Whitman, you don't realize how close you are to him. The weird thing is, this is 1855. This is 150 years ago. And yet, 
the speech patterns are recognizable, aren't they? You can, I think you can. You look at, I can do it. Saw their approach. Saw for those who were near me. Saw the white sails of the schooners in food. Saw the ships in anger. Look, comes right out off my tongue, right? I'm sure it comes right off your tongue. You read that one. You read it to someone, your family, your boyfriend, your, your, your girlfriend, your mom, your dad, someone, your sister, or whatever. The sailors are working the rigging or outside this ride the bars. The round mass is swinging most of the holes. The sun, it doesn't matter if it doesn't rhyme, you see? It's got a rhythm that just flows like the water flows. The round mass swing most of the sense of the hulls. The sun is a certain kind of penance, the large and small steamers in motion, the pilots in their pilot houses. I wouldn't even be able to plot that out. I don't know how to go da 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 You know, if you're ever in your English classes have to parse puns and see what the rhythm was and so on. And I wouldn't even be able to catalog this rhythm, but it's there. The white wake left the passage in the quick, tremulous whirl of the wheels, the flags of all nations, the falling of them at sunset. It is sunset. The scalp edge waves in the twilight. It is twilight. The ladle cups, the frolics and crescent, listening to the stretch far, far, growing dimmer and dimmer. The gray walls, the grand storehouses by the docks on the river, the shadowy group. The big steam tug close flanked on each side of the barge, the hay boat, the blade of lighter, a picture of New York Harbor in 1855. On the neighboring shores, the fire from the beginning of industrialization, from the foundry chimneys burning high and glaring in the end of the night, probably the reason the North was able to uh, overcome the South in the Civil War, all these foundries and things like that, that could produce the equipment and the manpower to overwhelm a more agrarian society. Casting their flicker of black contrasting wild red and yellow light over the tops of houses down on the special streets, you take the Circle Line boat when you go visit Manhattan and uh, you know, go up the East River, you'll see these same foundry chimneys sitting up there at night with their glow. Power stations and things. These and all else, <coughs> number four, were to me the same as they are to you. That's the message that's being sent once again. I stand somewhere waiting for you. These and all else just about the same message repeatedly here. We're the same for me as they are to you. He thinks you're feeling the same thing he thinks. He thinks if you were standing on the side of the uh, railing of the boat, you would be uh, seeing and feeling what he's feeling. And he thinks that brings a correspondence. The only problem is he doesn't realize for most of us there are no ferry boats left. And we're not going to be standing by the ferry boat looking at what he's looking at. And the harbor isn't going to look the same anymore. He doesn't, he's not, He's not clever enough, I think, to understand or, or perceive that, that change <coughs> happening. Um, but other than that, I think he's right to some extent that we do are going to feel what he feels. Each person who lives repeats a certain uh, feeling. Love well these cities. Love well the stately and rapid river. The men and women I saw were all near to me. He likes them all again. You see, he doesn't distinguish between men and women. He's not a misogynist. He's not a chauvinist. He loves. He just loves. Others the same. And there's that others theme again. Others will look back on me because I look forward to them. You're going to look back on him because he's looking forward to you. So now he's gotten personal, hasn't he? The message is totally personal. Does he, uh, oh, he likes you, obviously. He thinks he does anyway. But he thinks that because he's looking forward to you, you're going to be looking back on him. He's talking to you, each person here reading the poem. Now that I'm forced you to read it, you're one of the people that he's addressing. He didn't fight the, the tree in the forest. If, the tree fell in the forest, there's no one there to hear it. Was there a sound? That's the ancient question. I think there was. I don't think it depends on the ear. But a lot of people think there's no sound without someone hearing it. In any case, this is a similar thing. Suppose you never read this. Are you being spoken to? Well, obviously not. But the moment you have read it, you are being spoken to, and there is a response. So. He's depending, and he thinks you're looking back at him because he looked forward to you. And in fact, we are. We don't want to admit it. But now, since it's happened, we are looking back at him. I am, for sure. 
whether you're joining me is your business. But depends how much these poems affect you. But I tell you, they're better than most poems you'll read in the New Yorker magazine or the paper or someplace where they print an occasional poem and you say, what is that poem about? That poem tells me nothing. You know, you read these flimsy poems that they print in these places, you're sort of like, what's going on here? What's the person trying to say? With me, you don't have any trouble to figure out what he's trying to say. So, you know, he's clear. So I think that's a, a big plus, too. The time will come. He's preaching me now. The time is coming, though I stop here today and tonight, that this is going to happen. Then he asks, what is it then between us? I hate to say uh, these silly parallels that come to my mind, and you probably don't even, don't even remember this particular movie. But there was a narrative in this one movie recently where you could tell the guy had been reading Whitman. Uh, it was uh, a thin red line. How many saw that movie, A Thin Red Line? I don't know if you saw it. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a famous director, um, the guy, um, I think he directed Badlands, the other director, what's his name? Yeah. It's pretty famous, um, it starts with Anne Maverick, Man, um, something or something with Anne, he was a really cult movie maker. Anyway, around ten years or eight years ago, he did this movie, oh, less than that, about five years ago, he did this movie, Thin Red Line, and the hero of it didn't. Guadalcanal, it has to do with the Battle of Guadalcanal. And the guy is always asking these questions to himself, just like this. What is it then between us? And what are we thinking now? And he's got his consciousness going, and, he's, and the whole rhythm is Whitman. You can just hear it. Did you get, take a look at that movie. In fact, the star of that movie is the Jim Cavazell. That, that's what he got started, who made the Passion of Christ the movie, and the star of that movie. That's where he got his start in the red, red line. So, and then that's the question. So, always you get um, running through his mind. I can't remember who the director was, but it'll come to me. Starts with M. Anyway, what is it then between us? What is the count of the scores of hundreds of years between us? What is it? Hundreds of years. It is hundreds of years. <coughs> he says, whatever it is, it avails not. Distance avails not. So you can understand what he's saying. This is not poetry that is obscure that you can't understand. Place avails not. It's a religious statement again now. These things matter or don't matter. Place, distance, I don't care where you are. I don't care what the time between us is. Here's what's the same. I too lived. Maybe you think I didn't. Maybe you think you're the only one who is living. And that's how it sometimes appears to one. But I, too, lived just like you. Brooklyn of Ample Hills was mine. Now it's supposed to be a huge slum, though it's being renewed. But at that time, for him, Brooklyn is of Ample Hills. It's a beautiful place. I, too, walked the streets of Manhattan Island and bathed in its waters around it. Not many people bathe in the waters around Manhattan Island today, <laughs> except the Boulder American Bear Club or somebody who likes to do in the polluted water, but they are cleaning it up, and there are people who do bathe, but it's not a swimming hole the way it was for him. I, too, felt the curious, abrupt questioning stir within me the sexual emergence. In the day, among the crowds of people, sometimes they came upon me as walking among the crowds of commuters. In my walks home late at night, the same walks that he'll be encountering Lincoln in the next time. Or as I lay in my bed, they came upon me. I, too, had been struck from the float. He made that word up, whatever it means. Forever held in solution. Something, something in the, solu in, the, in the float of life was causing me to question whatever thing that I was part of in it. I, too, had received my identity by my body. You see, he's not like the body like either. He's just an attitude, the same like the body. By, not by my soul, by my body. That I was, I knew was of my body. And what I should be, I knew it should be of my body. Uh, I'm not throwing this body away so easily. Don't have contempt for this poor flesh. 
that I was, I was. So he's really throwing himself right in the face of uh, 2,500 years of Western philosophy and religion, don't you think, with these kinds of statements. I said, hasn't anyone else said it before? No, I don't think anyone did. I don't think anyone did. They said, well, this is a dumb poet in America, some little, you know, nobody from Long Island who didn't even go to college. He can set himself up against the great philosophers of the universe. Yeah, that's what the democratic man allows you to do. You don't have to go to uh, Heidelberg or Cambridge or Oxford or someplace like that. The democratic man says, you can talk just plain talk from nowhere. Okay, changes gears again. But there's a statement right there. It's not upon you alone the dark patches fall, the dark through its patches down on me. Nightfall, the dark is coming. I've experienced that. My great thoughts, I suppose, were not in reality meager. Were they not in reality meager? Nor is it you alone who know what it is to be evil. Now, here he defines what he considers evil, though it's again more religious things. I don't consider that we think that this is terribly evil today. As I said, there's much bigger evils than this. Killing babies, putting people in gas chambers, genocide, lopping people's heads off, uh, mugging people on the street, and raping, things like that. I consider that's where the evil we are familiar with would be. But for him, it's just like the seven deadly sins, really. I blabbed too much. I was contrary. I blushed. This is what he considers evil. What an innocent universe, huh? I resented. I lied. I stole. I grudged. I had guile, anger, lust. Hot wishes I dared not speak. In other words, I had, you know, sexual urges that I was ashamed of. The wayward, uh, greedy, shallow, sly, cowardly, the malignant, the wolf, the snake, the hawk, not wanting me, the cheating, the, anyway, it goes on with this repertoire of supposed evils. These are just control issues, I would think, mostly. Anyway, after that, which I think is the weakest part of the poem, but it does endear you to him as a really simple fine fellow who's even embarrassed about all these things, things that most of the people you know wouldn't think twice about, um, was called by my nice name by clear loud voices of young men as they saw me approaching or passing, felt their arms on my neck as I stood or negligently leant, now he's back to the old form, leaning of their flesh against me as I sat. So many I loved in the street or ferry boat or public assembly, it never told them a word. Lived the same life with the rest, the same old laughing, gnawing, sleeping, played the part that looks back at the actor or actress, the same old role, the role that, that is what we will make it, great as we are or small as we like, or both great and small. Okay, being called by his nice name, that's going to reappear. How many um, are literature majors at all here? How many have read James Joyce? You know, um, Fortunately Artist is a Young Man, you know that book? When James Joyce in that book decides to leave the ministry and go to college, he runs out on the strand and he has a kind of vision of a beautiful woman that looked like a, you know, almost a bird, she was so beautiful. And I think as he's walking out or coming back, these boys are calling to him and uh, almost calling him by his nice name. They say, Stephen, Stefano Flora, stuck him, you know, and they're all calling out to him. <coughs> I have a feeling that Joyce is read with him for that scene, although it just may be a coincidence. That's the kind of scene that we have here, if you remember that. I don't know if you remember it, but uh, she does. Anyone else remember that scene in Port of George, Young Man? Well, that makes three of us anyway. <laughs> Okay. Uh, these are universal feelings. Then. Yeah, they may just be universal, but you know, I have a feeling some of these people like Nietzsche did, did read with And I think Joyce read a lot, so I would have thought that she would have read with him. Never mind. Okay, look, I'm not finished with this statement, so hold on. Seven. Closer yet I approach you. What thought you have of me now? I have much of you. He's not talking about the boat or the waves or anything. He's talking again to you. 
I laid in my stores in advance. I came to the wrong seriously with you before you were born. Who knows? Who wants to know what should come home to me? Who knows where I am enjoying this? Who knows for all the distance but I'm as good as looking at you now? Or you cannot see me. Hey, you don't even know I'm out here right now. He's really moving fast, getting closer to you and closer to you, seducing you in the way he would seduce probably someone of his own time. I'm maybe right there now, looking at you. Who knows? You can't be sure. And then he back to his other theme about Manhattan, America. Manhattan, in this case, is his home that he loves. And whatever is more stately and admirable to me than mask him Manhattan, river and sunset and scalped at waves of flood times of seagulls oscillating their bodies, the hay now he's repeating his themes. The hay boat, the twilight, the belated light. What gods can exceed these that clasp me by the hand? And he's walking on the streets and he sees his, you want to say homosexual? I don't know. Uh, Quasi-homosexual friends, at least intimate man friends. There would be no women on the streets that he could. This would be like Baghdad. There'd be no women to be calling out to on the streets. You know, Baghdad, when you're walking around there, I'm sure what's so striking is there are no women anywhere. They're all in the homes hiding. Or, you know, with burdens on or something. Uh, surely women wouldn't like to be subjected to that kind of a regime. So I think that maybe you should give those credit who are trying to free people from that rather than the hostile to always, because it is a noble endeavor to try to, because uh, these people cannot free themselves from these things. It's impossible. The cultural things are so heavy and strong and the uh, weight of the people above them that it's impossible for them to free themselves. And, um, Say, well, leave them in their uh, misery then, or whatever it is they're, they're involved in. Well, I don't think that's, that's necessarily the right thing to do, because that can cause serious problems in the universe that we're watching now. People who want to do suicide bombings and blow up cities and stuff, who are frustrated and have a, a lot of uh, hostility. So um, you have to weigh those things. Anyway, there's no women here on the streets, and no more than there would be in these other places today. What gods can exceed these that clasp me by the hand, whose voices I love call me promptly and loudly, there it is, by my nighest name. So once again, he's being called by his nighest name as I approach. Intimate, intimate feelings with comrades. In this case, male, quasi-sexual, if you like. At least they touch each other affectionately, put their arms around each other, or their, you know, on their shoulders, or whatever. What is more subtle than this which ties me, he says it's woman or man, to the woman or man that looks in my face. When I look them full in the face, there's a bond which fuses me into you now and pours my meaning you and you too will read me. That fuses, we're fusing together and I'm pouring my meaning into you too. Maybe you don't want it, but I'm doing it because Isaac is helping me. Isaacman didn't force you to do that, but it would be happy. And then he asks you again. It's interesting to write a poem to the audience. We understand then, do we not? There's been a communication between us, what I promised, without mentioning it, at the beginning really. Have you not accepted? I don't know, have we? What the study could not teach, what the preaching could not accomplish, is accomplished, is it not? Isn't that great English? Simple as can be, and perfect rhythm. Totally inspired stuff, whether you agree with it or not. Oh, he's excited now. He's really excited. He's got you. He's made the connection. That's all he wants to do is make a connection. He doesn't want to really exploit it to an extent. He just wants to be in touch, like the internet or something. It would be like being on the internet with dead people. They could be out there on their internet and get in touch with you. Flow on, river, flow with the flood tide. Oh, he's really got it now, hasn't he? And that when the ebb die, he's really excited. Frog on, crested and scalloped edge waves, the same thing back again. Gorgeous clouds, sunset drench with your splendor me. That's a great line. Look at that one. <coughs> could you write a line like that? Drench with your splendor me. I mean, normally, what would you write? Drench me with your splendor, right? 
something like that. He says, drench with your splendor me. <laughs> he interrupts the normal pattern of the speech to make it even more powerful and fact. I wish I could write like that, drench with your splendor. And he did, he was going to college. And I got a PhD. I can't write as good as him. So you see, there's some hope for all. You probably can write as good as him without knowing it. What do you think? Don't you think so? You don't think so? You tried, you could, I'm sure. I bet you could. Anyway, he thinks you could. Drench with your splendor, me. That's the, what, probably the best line of this whole book. Maybe you guys don't like it. <laughs> yeah, everyone's cup of tea is not the same thing. Or the men and women generations after me, back again to that theme. And then here it is. See, they too, like me, cross from shore to shore, countless crowds of passengers. These commuters are always moving from shore to shore, <coughs> going up the freeways, down the freeways. Though I must say, I don't feel as close to the people on the freeways as he feels to the people on the ferry boat. <laughs> Maybe on the subway in some place you would. Maybe on bar. How many have taken bar? You feel close when you're on bark to the people? Yeah, you do? Okay, well, that's uh, bark's better than the freeway for that. Throb, baffled. Oh, no. Okay, where, where are we? Here, where? Stand up, tall mass of Manhattan. Now we're using the Indian name. Stand up, beautiful hills of Brooklyn. Throb, baffled and curious brain. Throb, questions and answers. Oh, he's really worked up. Suspend here, never eternal flow of solution. Gaze, loving and thirsting eyes in the House of Street of Public Assembly. Sound out voices of young men, loudly and musically. Call me by my nice name. There it go. That's a big point for him for some reason. It's really in his brain. Live all life. Play the part. Look back on the actor, actresses. He likes the, uh, the theater. Play the role, the role that great or small, according to that makes it. Consider you who peruse me where I may not be on no ways, but looking upon you. Be firm, Rail. <laughs> Don't break when I'm leaning on you. It's just the, just the little things. Support those who lean idly. He loves to lean idly. Get haste with the hasting current. i got to get moving because it's rush hour. Fly on, seabirds. Fly sideways. Wheel in large circles high in the air. Receive summer sky. You water and faithfully hold it till all downcast eyes have time to take it from you. Diverge, fine spokes of light. We've heard about the light now, and he's just recapitulating from the shape of my head or anyone's head in the sunlit water. We say, what's he going? What's he saying? What's he finally going to do with all this? Come on, ships from the lower bay. Pass up that white sailed schooner, sloops, lighters, float away, flying from all nations. Be duly lowered at sunset. Burn out your fires, foundry chimneys. Cast black shadows at night. Cast red and yellow light over the tops of the houses. Appearance is now hen for and henceforth, or henceforth indicate what you are. This is his final point, I think. You necessary film, film continue to envelop the soul. You all are the envelope in which my soul is enveloped. About my body for me and your body for you, be hung our divine aromas. His armpits are still there. <laughs> but these things are divine. Thrive, cities. Bring your freight, bring your shows, ample and sufficient rivers expand. Get on with it, Los Angeles, Long Beach. Don't worry, I don't mind. Expand, being what none else is, perhaps more spiritual, and you are spiritual to me, because you are beautifully physical. Keep your place as objects, that which none else is more lasting. You have waited. You always wait, you dumb, beautiful ministers. The Beatniks love that line. We receive you with free sense at last and are insatiate henceforth. Not, not you anymore shall be able to foil us or withhold yourselves from us. Still talking again to you again. We use you. We do not cast you aside. We plant you permanently within us. We fathom you not. We love you. There is perfection in you also. You furnish your parts towards eternity, great or small. You furnish your parts towards the soul. Well, it gets pretty Hindu by the end there. Everyone is one huge, perfect ensemble moving towards eternity, furnishing their parts to, I guess, one huge, big world soul. That's it, man. Uh, it's a 
a good poem, don't you think? Whether you understand what he's trying to say or not. Don't you think it's a good poem? I uh, hope you could write as well someday. I don't think I could do it. Anyone here think they could measure up? Shame, isn't it? We should all be able to do as well as that. If he's not, he's writing very sophisticated. All right, let's look at the last one. We'll finish up on an old poor walk. This may not be a purely religious poem, but I think it is probably his most beautiful poem in many ways. And it's unexpected. And it's, of course, all completely American. And it's a poem they don't read to you in your classes. When they read about Lincoln, they read this next poem here, Oh, Captain, My Captain. But this poem is like an incredible one of his long poems, and so people are frightened because it's long, but it's not that long. And he writes it right at the moment. You are there better than a camera. You are there when Lincoln is assassinated. You are right there, and he's giving you the emotions of the moment as he's feeling them, as others are feeling them. And he's known him from the biographies that I read here, the jottings. He used to walk on the streets at night because he couldn't sleep, and sometimes he'd see Lincoln go by, uh, and they would glance at each other and nod to each other. And um, he had deep feeling for Lincoln, which shows you something of what people felt at that time. Now, as we read this poem, he will say things that are so amazing to me for a person to say about his president that we don't experience much anymore. He's full of love, as you see. He loves everyone on the street. He loves, he loves, he loves you. He loves everybody. Yet he also wants America to succeed. He's patriotic, tremendously patriotic. He's not cruel. He may be somewhat gay, but he's not gay in the way that he's making a you know, huge statement about it. Part of his sexual makeup, he's not flaunting or beating anyone over the head one way or the other. But he loves President Lincoln. It's not just that he likes him as his candidate, he loves him. He he, he loves him. And when he's killed, he wants to write him the most beautiful funeral dirge that he can. But he doesn't know how to do it. Because he wants it to be more beautiful than anything he's ever written. Because he loves this man so much that his death is so tragic and awful to him that he wants to pour out his grief in some way that is beyond what he's done before. This is how he tries to do it. It's an odd way to do it, but as you go through the poem, you realize that in fact, as he moves along, he's succeeding. He's succeeding. And in fact, you know, you do feel this grief, and it is totally original. I mean, whoever, you're going to write about grief and you're going to start talking about lilacs in the dooryard blooming? What's one thing got to do with the other? But we'll see what it has to do with the other movement. Right off the bat, what's the lilac got to do with Lincoln? How many of you have ever seen a lilac? You know what lilacs are? You're in for a sad life if you don't know what lilacs are. Sad experience. Lilacs are a bush flowering bush that you get east of the Rockies. I don't know how far west of the Rockies they come. But all across the eastern, middle, western part of the United States, you have lilacs. And these lilacs bloom in the spring. We don't really have a spring, so we don't get that. Um, but they bloom before the other flowers, usually, a little bit. Not totally before them, but right as the early part of the spring, they start coming out in these bushes. There are light whitish purple flower, depending on the bush, usually a light little violet purple flower on the bush. How many of you, again, have seen lilacs? Ah, only about 10 of you. Ooh, painful, painful, painful. Okay, those who've seen lilacs, are they ever, can you forget having seen them once you've seen them in blue? I don't think so, because what do they have? 
Huh? They have the most delicious odors you can imagine. Sort of like orange blossoms have. You go to an orange grove when they're blossoming. But it's just totally delicious scent and smell of that place. It's overwhelming. It's just beautiful. And there's no way that you can describe it if you haven't smelled it. And they do be talking springtime. So what is the connection with Lincoln of this lilac bush? He was killed in the spring? Huh? Was he killed in the spring? Oh yeah, he was killed in the spring for sure. That's when the Civil War ended in April. Oh, <coughs> he was killed in April. Huh? Alaskan depression. No, what it is is he's going to take a sprig from the lilac and put it on Lincoln's car. That's what he's going I know you haven't been reading this poem. You want me to do all the reading for you, don't you? You want me to do everything for you. Look, I've read this poem a hundred times. You haven't read it once. You could do it once and let me help you the second time. Do me the favor to go through it a little bit. His eyes when you're too easy on us. You don't make us do these things like other teachers. Yeah, I don't want to make you do anything you don't want to do. I'm not into, I'm not the, I'm not the, uh, I'm not the policeman. I'm not trying to beat you over the head. You want to read the poem? Don't. No, it's your business. You want me to read it for you? Okay, I don't want to. I think you should be given a try. Right? So, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Yes, he's going to take the sprig of lilac and place it on the coffin as it goes by. As a tribute to the one he loves. So that's Realize that from the guy, and let's start off. When lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed, and the great star early drooped in the western sky in the night, I mourned, and yet shall mourn with ever returning spring. Okay, it's a beautiful dirge. He's mourning. Who's he mourning? Lincoln. But as it will turn out, he's mourning, going to mourn all the dead in the, in the Civil War. It's a mourning song for everybody who was killed. Sadly, unnecessary. Primarily Lincoln. And what's the great star that early drooped in the western sky? It's both the star, I don't know which star that comes out of the west, the north star or uh, Jupiter or uh, I don't have a footnote on that, one of these uh, famous stars that you see in the west at that time, but also Lincoln is the western star because he came out of the west. So you both have the star in the sky and Lincoln as the star from the West. You got it? I'm more than going to clarify this poem for you. Ah, oh, you could have gotten that reading the first two lines, couldn't you? No. Takes some help. Takes about five readings. Get strange as it may seem. <coughs> okay. It is springtime. Ever returning spring, Trinity sure to me you bring, lilac blooming perennial and drooping star in the west, and thought of him I love. That's the Trinity. Again, lilac blooming yearly, perennially, drooping star in the west, Lincoln, and the western star, whatever star that is at this time, and thought of him I love. Now you see, when he says he loves the president, we don't feel embarrassed for him. Because we know he actually does love it. You know, I've lived through a lot of presidents. I really can't say I love Franklin Roosevelt. I love Dwight Eisenhower. I love Gerald Ford. I love John Kennedy. I love Richard Nixon. I, yet have, I love Lyndon Johnson. I maybe liked a few of them, didn't like a few of them, but love, I don't feel love for them. Even Reagan, the admirers of Reagan Island. I still love the guy, he did some impressive things and so on. I'm talking about myself. I'm trying to think of someone I love. Clinton, Bush, father, I can't speak about Junior yet, but I felt like getting maybe my love is diminishing. But uh, the point is, he says he loves the president. And not many people these days can talk like that, can they? I mean, even if you're voting for John Kerry, I'm sure you don't love him. And so, you follow what I'm trying to say? So this is really pretty unique that someone loves, actually loves that person. This person elicited love. And 
he'll, he'll repeat it. Like a woman in the thought of him I love. And now he starts his cry. Oh, powerful western fallen star, Lincoln is the powerful western fallen star. Oh, shades of night, oh, moody, tearful night, oh, great star disappeared, Lincoln is gone. Oh, the black murk that hides the star, oh, cruel hands that hold me powerless, again, you feel the, 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 the pain uh, crying out. Uh, oh, helpless soul of me, oh, harsh surrounding cloud that will not free my soul in the morning and the, and the whatever you want to call it, the misery that you feel when someone is departed that you love. Change gears. In the door fronting an old farmhouse in the whitewash paneling, see this stuff, he just rattles right off. Stands the lilac bush, I'm going to tell you all about it. This really happened. Tall growing with heart-shaped leaves, that's what they look like. They have these little heart-shaped leaves, very rich and dark green. A rich green with many a pointed blossom rising delicately. And then, as I told you, with the perfume strong I love. See, he loves the perfume too. And I said, if you ever... And he's going to compare his love of Lincoln to the love of the perfume of the, of the lilac tree. And if you've ever smelled a lilac tree, it does elicit love. Loving of the scent, that's for sure. Many people give it to their boyfriend or girlfriend. So bouquets of lilac cut from the tree. With every leaf a miracle, and from the bush in the Dior door yard, with delicate colored blossoms and heart-shaped leaves of rich green, a sprig with its flower, I break. Look how he interrupts the rhythm. You can see that. You know all about poetry. You see how he interrupts that rhythm? A sprig with this power I break. What was that one we had in the last poem? Drench with your splendor, me. A sprig with its flower I break. It's a totally different rhythm than the other one. And even you know everything about poetry. You can all see that, right? It's really great stuff. So he's focusing on it. That's his way of, so we know that's important. What is it he does? Coming out of his house, the stoop, the bushes in front of the house, the lilac are blooming, it's springtime. What's he do? He breaks a sprig from the tree. I told you that's what he does. And what's he going to do with that? Oh, he's going to put it on the coffin when it goes by. Like Princess Diana's funeral or something like that. Now he switches gears entirely to some really crazy thing in the middle of nowhere. He's got a very original mind at this point in his life. He's going off, we've heard about this bird before in the other, one of the other places, <coughs> but he's going off to the swamp. You know, around Washington and the south in Virginia, there's lots of swamps. We don't have so many swamps here in California. They don't have that much water. They have swamps, low-lying swamps. You know, I don't say they have crocodiles, but they got birds that are tweeting around in there, stuff you rarely see in town. And what's he looking for in this swamp? Not, not, not crocodiles. Names. What's he looking for? Huh? The hermit thrush. So called because it likes to keep its solitariness. It's a thrush. I don't even think we have thrushes in the West, actually. Thrushes are mostly a Middle Western Eastern bird. And you rarely see a thrush out here. <coughs> you don't even see robin redbreasts out here. All you see is crows, hummingbirds. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's true. You don't see, you know, all you see birds on the way going somewhere else, but they don't stop right. The, the nicest looking bird I ever see here is, uh, the, is the red winged blackbird occasionally comes through. But uh, other than that, um, or the gold headed sparrow, but you don't see many good birds unless you really look for them. You see good seabirds. Anyway, uh, hummingbirds. Uh, but you don't have any thrushes. These are songbirds. You know, it's amazing how few songbirds there are in the West Coast. You go out inside some place. You don't hear birds like <laughs> all day long. How many are from places where they have these birds chirping all day long? Any of you guys? Yeah? Can you remember that? It, it is like that, isn't it? In some of these places, these birds are like chirping away like mad. Isn't that true? Here they don't hear these chirpy birds so much. But anyway, imagine you're in a place with lots of chirpy birds singing away, singing away, singing away. But the most beautiful one is the hermit thrush. And that's why he picks on the hermit thrush. So he's going to go find a bird that can sing more beautifully than all the others. A solitary bird that is nowhere usually seen. You have to go into the deep recesses of the swamps to find it. You got it? 
That's why he's looking for the hermit I know this sounds dumb. In the swamp of secluded recesses, a shy and hidden bird is warbling, warble, warbler's warble, a song. Solitary the thrush, the hermit, withdrawn to himself, avoiding settlement, sings by himself a song. Again, if no one hears it, is it being sung? I think Whitman would say yes. And here's the hermit thrush's song. Song of a bleeding heart, death's out that song. The bird is going to be the poet singing death's out that song. For well, dear brother, speaking now to the bird like a human being, I know if thou wast not granted to sing, thou would surely die just like he himself as a poet has to recite his poem. Okay, he's mentioned the bird. Back to number five. What's happening in number five? I think the coffin's moving in number five. Over the breast of the spring, the land of the cities, amid lanes and through old woods, where lately violets peep with the ground, spotting the grain debris amid the grass in the field, uh, see each side of the lane, passing the endless grass, passing the yellow speared wheat, every grain from a shroud in the springtime, dark brown fields uprisen, passing the apple tree blows of white and pink in the orchards, carrying a corpse to where it shall rest in the grave. Night and day journeys a coffin. Lincoln is being taken home to where? Illinois. This is Lincoln's funeral procession or journey back to where he came from. He gets really serious. So he's introduced all his elements. He's introduced the line act. He's introduced the thrush. He's introduced the song. He's introduced the procession. We're just going to tie all these things together, aren't we? So if this poem looks like it's going nowhere, yet this poem is really complex and extremely rich. So he starts talking about this this coffin. I don't know about time to finish it. Uh, Five more minutes here, I doubt it will finish it, but we'll get pretty close to it. Coffin that passes through lanes and streets through day and night. This is a picture now of Lincoln's funeral, just like it was New York Harbor. With the great cloud darkening the land, and it's all for us to see. We're all Americans, wherever we come from. This is part of our history now. With the pomp and the up in loop flags, with the cities draped in black, it was like 9 11, but worse. The show of the states themselves as the crepe veiled women standing with processions long and winding in the flambeaux of the 90s, showing you the, the pictures of the Lincoln's funeral at the stations and places, with the torches. With the countless torches lit, with the silent sea of faces and the unbared heads, with the waiting depot, the arriving coffin and the somber faces. He didn't have television then, but he could see it all. With dirges through the night, with a thousand voices rising strong and solemn, with all the mournful voices of the dirges poured around the coffin, the dim lit churches and the shuddering organs, where amid these you journey with the tolling, tolling bells, perpetual clang. And he doesn't just say tolling bells, what does he say? Tolling, tolling bells. He's trying to imitate the sound. He's great. He suddenly does things like that. Here, coffin. That slowly passes. I give you my sprig of life. You see, you could have figured that out. If you'd read five lines of his poem, right? I got you dead right. You didn't even read up in section six. Yeah. But more than once, when you commented, they read much more than I have, but you commented about how he lazy or that these lines seem to roll off his tongue. And yet, when I read these, I picture somebody tearing up the thing and throwing it away and rewriting it. No, I think he did rewrite it, but he gives the impression that they just roll off. But I agree, he certainly worked it. He worked at these. Anyway, I give you my spring of life. I don't think he tore much up, but I think he worked. Not for you alone, for one alone. You see, all right, it's not just for you, Lincoln. I love you, but you're not the only one. I am now overwhelmed with this sadness. Blossoms and branches green to the coffins, all I bring, all the dead of the war. For fresh as the morning, thus would I chant a song for you, O sane and sacred death, all over bouquets of roses, and now not just lilacs, whole bouquets of flowers. O death, I cover you over with roses and early lilies and Mostly now the lilac that blooms the first. Copious I break, I break the sprigs from the bushes. With loaded arms I come, pouring for you, for you, and the coffins all of you, O oh death. As he's seen the killing in the Civil War. 
see now you see this man is gripped with another vision, isn't he? And he's really feeling it deeply. This is why I think it's obvious anybody with any fairness, regardless of some of the junk he wrote, he's easily the greatest American poet up until this moment. Just not even. There's just no competition. <laughs> he's far. He's far away out front. And you can tell people in the English department, like I said that I'm not embarrassed. <laughs> and I'm sure you'll understand why I said it. Oh, Western orb, sailing the heaven. Now I know what you must have meant as a month since I walked, as I walked in silence, the transparent, shadowy night. As I saw you had something to tell, as you bent to me night after night, as you drooped from the sky low down as if to my side, while the other stars all looked on, as we wandered together the solemn night, for something I know not what kept me from sleep, as the night more night advanced, and I saw on the rim of the west how full you were of woe, as I stood on the rising ground and breezed in the cool, transparent night, as I watched where you passed and was lost in another word black of the night, as my soul in its trouble dissatisfied sank as where you as where you sat or concluded dropped in the night and was gone. What's he talking about? Yeah. Uh, or you're just stretching. <laughs> What's he talking about? Somewhat recent, isn't he? Huh? No, I don't think so. He's yeah, in effect, but he's had a premonition. This is now, he goes back a month. He goes back a month, you see? A month since I walked. I was a month ago, before all these things happened. And maybe saw Lincoln driving by, and I walked in silence, and I saw the star. Now it's a regular star in the sky, whatever star it is. And it was drooping, and he thought it was a western star, and it was telling him something. You know, as you walk, you look at the heavens, and you think there's something being told you, but you don't know what it is. And he knew there was something terrible going to happen. He didn't know what it was at that time, but he had a premonition that something awful was coming, and uh, my soul's trouble dissatisfied. Change gears. I'm going to stop in a minute. Just give me a little more time here. This is too holy a poem to just jump up in the middle here. We'll just find a good place. Sing on there in the swamp, oh singer bashful and tender nine. I hear your notes. I hear your call. I hear. I come presently. I understand you. Who's he talking to? How many of you got birds that you talk to in your house? I got a bird I talk to. It's really weird. He makes me talk to him. He's the weirdest thing. I mean, you know, he yowls and shrieks when I come in the door. He flew down on my wife's uh, shoulder one day when she was out gardening, and he, she put him in a cage, and he stayed there. And he's crazy. This bird is like a dog. He was a watch. What he's a watch. He's a watchdog bird. Nobody can get in the house I was walking, and yet when you come near him, he comes down and he wants you to pet him. And uh, you end up talking to him because you feel sorry for him. You say, okay, bird, you know, I know how you feel, you know, and so on. You start talking to this bird. Uh, it's really weird. So, yeah, he's talking to the bird here, you know, and he says there, I hear, I'm coming. That's so all I, when he's yelling at me, I say, hey, wait up, I'm coming down the stairs, don't worry, I'm going to come pet you. For a moment I linger, for the lustrous star has detained me. The star my departing comrade holds and, det and detains me. So the star is two things. One, it's Lincoln. The other is the star that gave him the premonition at the beginning. It's, he calls Lincoln his departing comrade. <coughs> and he's going to go and see the bird, but he has to still talk to, about this other thing. Oh, how shall I warble myself? Now he's going to sing like the bird. Myself for the dead man there I love. I loved him, and I will sing for him. And how shall I deck my song for the large, sweet soul that is gone? Lincoln is the large, sweet soul. It's a good description of him. I don't think we would characterize Nixon or Johnson or any of these people as a large, sweet soul. And what shall my perfume be for the grave of him I love? Sea winds blown from the east and west, blown from the eastern sea and blown from the western sea, American national perfumes. Till there are there on the prairies meeting, these and with these and the breath of my chant, I'll perfume the grave of him I love. So he's going to perfume Lincoln's grave with all the winds and sea breezes of America. I'll leave you there. We'll pick up there next time. Maybe you'll read the rest of the story. Thanks for coming with you.